All right. Well, welcome to everyone for coming to our workshop. So we wanted to remind you all that this is a webinar, so we cannot hear or see you um, throughout the presentation. And I will read a quick bio about Janae really quick. For the past 10 years, Janae Chandler has been teaching personal finance in higher education, most recently at Brigham Young University, where she helped develop the online course in family finance. Janae is currently a PhD candidate at the University of Utah. Her research centers on applying what we know about human behavior and brain science to how we handle money. Janae and her husband, Josh, are the parents of four children ages 6 to 14. Janae's focus is on helping others, creating value, and teaching them to direct their resources toward their highest commitments. And all right, I'll have Janae take it away from here. Awesome. Thank you, Ruby, so much for that introduction. I am a good friend of the Financial Wellness Center, so it's a privilege to be here and talk to you. Um, so like Ruby mentioned, I have taught personal finance um, for a lot of years. And I have to be honest, my tax class is my very favorite one. And I always tell the students that and they're like, you're kidding me, this was supposed to be boring. But it always ends up being one of the funnest classes during the year. I, I think part of it is that people are interested in taxes. It's kind of a, in some ways we get, we have like opinions about taxes and it really impacts. It's one of the ways that government and our real life really hit up next to each other. And so if you don't have any other like opinions about government, you might still have opinions <laughs> about taxes. Um, so we're going to talk about it. And I am, I'm really trying to bring out the most relevant points about um, federal income taxes for college students. I really had you in mind as I put this together. And I feel convinced that you're gonna walk away from this presentation feeling a lot more confident about understanding how taxes work. And I'm gonna eliminate some of the confusion that a lot of people feel around taxes. Um, I just wanna start with this quote. I love it from Ben Franklin that he said, in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes, which I know sounds like a bummer if we're gonna relate death and taxes, but this is gonna be so much fun. I love it. So we're, so I, Ruby already introduced me. Um, I've taught in personal finance for a long time. I love it. I love taking things that are complicated and breaking it down in a way that people can understand. I, you just see the, I feel like finance is this area of our life where we have a lot of stress. And if someone can like put it in language that we understand and help us feel confident, so much, um, so much can be gained from that. And that's just kind of what I'm all about. So I'm really in my research as a PhD candidate, trying to figure out how do we do that? How do we help people really be motivated around making good financial decisions and sort of take away some of that stress. Um, so here's my little agenda for what we're gonna cover today. So I'm gonna start out kind of talking about if you need to file and if so, like what are the benefits that can be gained? Cause I think in our minds, we think taxes is all bad news, but I'm here to tell you there's a lot of good news, especially if you're a college student when it comes to filing your taxes. So that's gonna lead into my next point, which is how to maximize all those different tax breaks that are out there so that you can lower what you owe in taxes and potentially even get money back from the government from taxes, which you're kind of in the prime age target group for people to get money back from the government, which is kind of awesome. And then I'm just gonna end it talking about how, what is out there and available as far as free and low cost tax help there is so much help out there and it's less expensive to get it than it's ever been. And I just find that some people don't know about it. So they end up going to a really expensive um, alternative rather than accessing the free help that's out there. So I'm gonna break it down for you. But all right, first question for a lot of college students, especially because you might be um, the first year that you're kind of maybe a little bit more independent than your, from your family's finances. Um, and you're wondering, do I need to file taxes? And the income 
um, requirement. So if you have income above $12,200, so this is for 2020. So these are the taxes that we'll be filing for, if you haven't filed yet this year, you need to file them by April 5th or 15th. Um, so if you had income back in 2020 of $12,200 or above, then you're required by law to file taxes. And that number, if you're married and you're filing jointly, that's $24,400. So that's like the minimum requirement. If you have income below that, then you aren't required to file. But what I'm gonna tell you about the rest of this presentation is that even with income less than that, there's a really good reason why you will want to file. There's actually a lot of benefits if you fit into that category of having lower income. So we'll talk more about that. Um, making money from filing taxes. I know that that might, I don't know, some of you might be experienced with this and you know, yeah, I'm super excited. I know when I was a college student, I was always super excited to file my taxes because I knew I was going to have some money coming to me after I did that. Like I, back in those days, I would always like file just as soon as I could. It was usually like February 2nd, you know. Um, now when I'm more on the end of paying taxes, I like I like take my time getting around to it, um, but you really can in a certain stage of life make a lot of money from taxes. It's part of the, the way that the tax structure is set up. Um, a lot of, so most people in the lower income, they don't, they pay little or no federal taxes. So it's around, it changes as the law changes a little bit, but it's usually about 40 to 50% of the population doesn't actually have a tax responsibility when it comes to federal taxes. So even though you'll pay a paycheck and you'll still get money taken out of your paycheck for federal income tax, um, when you go to file, you'll end up with enough deductions or credits, we'll talk more about what all of those mean, in order to reduce your tax liability down to zero. And then that all that money that went in um, from your paycheck, you actually get back to you in the form of a refund. So that is sometimes a lot of the money that we get back from a refund isn't really money coming back from the government. It's really money that we have, we've overpaid in taxes. And so we're getting money back from what we've overpaid. Um, but if in certain categories, so refundable tax credits, there are these credits out there that they allow you actually to get money back from the federal government. So in addition to getting back whatever money you've paid in over the year, you'll get additional money back if you qualify for some of these refundable tax credits. And it can, we'll show you some examples, but it can actually be really a lot of money. Um, another thing, especially in this era that we've been living in with a lot of stimulus checks coming, um, you will want to file your taxes because that makes it easier to get your stimulus check. So the direct deposit that's used on your um, tax return is the one where your stimulus check is going to. And so it's possible still to get a stimulus check if you haven't filed for taxes, but it's a little bit more complicated. So filing your taxes makes it easier for the government to give money to you, which we like that, right? Um, I just wanted to put this little copy and paste every year after I teach um, about taxes in my class, um, I'll get some messages from students who um, are saying it's very similar. This is just a real typical example. Um, someone just said, hey, I wanted to let you know I um, filed an amendment to my taxes for a couple of years, like they were talking about last year, and they're going to get $2,000 back in addition because of things that they learned in my class about taxes. So it's there and I'm going to teach you just some little things that are going to help you say, hey, maybe I qualify for that one. I didn't know about that. But I get this type of message at least once a year where students are like, oh my gosh, I got I I was able to file um, a, a tax return and and um, qualify for some of the credits that you talked about. Okay. So before we get into all like that, that's the promise of like, this probably will end up being good for you financially. So I hope that like your ears are perked up because we're gonna get a little bit into understanding taxes. That's the way that we are able to make good decisions when it comes to um, navigating around taxes in a completely legal way, of course, that like 
making good decisions, accounting for taxes requires just some basic understanding. So I have to tell you, the tax code is very complicated. Like actually my computer is propped up on a textbook right now about all of the com uh, complications of the tax system. 100% American tax system is super, super complicated, but it's actually all based on a pretty simple formula that you're actually probably a lot more familiar with than you realize. Um, and if you keep that basic formula in mind and then realize that all the complications are just taking a little piece of that basic formula and making it more complicated, it helps you keep straight in your mind um, where it fits in the whole process. Um, and it really will help you make better decisions when it comes to um, making um, financial decisions that involve taxes. So here's my, um, here's, here's how you probably experienced and already sort of know how taxes work. So remember when you were a little kid and you, your mom or whoever, you earned a dollar, you earned a little bit of money doing some weeding in the yard or whatever you did in your family. And you, um, so whatever this is, the equivalent in your life, um, this is like speaking from, this is actually speaking from how I interact with my kids. They do some chores, they get a little bit of money. And then we go to the dollar store. And so you probably had this experience. For me, it was like penny candy. We would get a little bit of money. Maybe that dates me. Maybe I got penny candy, but we'd walk down to like the local gas station and they always like in the bottom row, they had like the candies that were like five cents and 10 cents, like the Tootsie Rolls. So we'd be like adding up how much we could afford. Um, but you always like, after the first time you realized, oh, I've got to have more money than what it is because I'll add up you know, I'll get my 20 pieces of five cent gum and I'll have my dollar, but they always want more money than that. It's going to cost a dollar and a little bit, right? So even when you're tiny, you start to realize, oh, taxes are kind of a percentage. Um, and so like with, when it comes to the dollar store, my kids are already like, okay, so I need about like a couple of cents. They're like always rounding it up. They're like 10 cents for every dollar. And then if I'm buying two items, then I need to have 20 cents. So that's like the basic um, sales tax, right? Sales tax is a lot more simple than income tax, but it's sort of the same formula. You have the price of the thing you're buying and you times it by the tax rate. And that tells you how much you owe in taxes. So the more expensive the item, the more you end up having to pay in taxes. Um, and the federal income tax is really, really similar. You just replace income for what the price of the thing you were gonna buy. So with the, the basic formula that's behind the federal income tax is your income times the tax rate equals the amount that you owe. So that that's all it is. I mean, and we sort of wish some of us, I don't know, like people who are advocating for a flat tax, which I don't 100% know how I stand on that, but uh, it would for sure make things a lot more complicated because then the formula would just look like this, right? You earn $50,000, you pay 10 or 20% or whatever, and then you have, you just times that to know what you owe in taxes. So lots of different complications, but some of the complications are kind of in your benefit. So I have a little graphic. I want you to pay attention. So this is like the, the more complicated formula, but pay attention to those big minus signs because those are the good parts, right? Those are the ones that reduce the amount you have to owe in taxes. So the a little, this is only one level of complication, but adding a little bit more complication, you take income minus the deductions times the tax rate equals tax liability. So then when you get to that point, that's like the taxes owed, then you minus credits and that's actually how much that you owe in taxes. So it's a little bit more complicated, but this has two really kind of cool things that help you reduce how much you want, you need to pay in taxes. Um, and those are the things you want to kind of pay attention to and keep in mind. So we're going to talk a little bit more about those deductions and credits. Those are the two things you want to keep in mind as ways, really helpful ways to reduce what you owe in taxes. So the first thing I want to talk about is tax deductions. I'm sure you have heard about this. Like, um, like people sometimes call it just like a tax break or it means sometimes we just have words that we use because we're not sure exactly what 
it is, but it's, we know that it's a way to reduce what we owe in taxes. And we, it's usually like a mystery. We're like, we don't know how this works, but somehow I'm supposed to save on my taxes if I buy a house. People have told me if you buy a house, then you're gonna pay less in taxes. Um, so deductions are, they're usually things that we spend money on that the federal government has said, hey, we think that's like a good thing. We want you to spend, we wanna encourage you to spend money on those things, or we think that spending money on those things has an additional kind of social benefit. So we're gonna give you a little bit of a reduction on the amount of income that is taxable. So that's what a deduction is. Some of the deductions that you may have heard of are like I mentioned, the mortgage tax deduction. So the, when you buy a home, part of your monthly payment each month goes toward paying the interest on the loan. And the government says, hey, we think people buying houses is a good thing. We wanna encourage that. And so we're gonna give them a little bit of a break on the amount that they pay in um, uh, interest on their mortgage. Um, charitable donations is another big one. It's again, the government's like, we think that's great. You know, those charitable organizations help the community and help the world in lots of ways. And so we feel like if you're gonna support that with money out of your own pocket, we're gonna give you a little bit of, break, of a break on your taxes for that. Um, other things are state and local taxes. Those are sometimes called salt taxes. So those are like, this is kind of a double taxation. That's like, well, if you've already paid taxes, then um, we're not going to tax you twice. We're going to give you a little bit of a benefit for having paid your property tax or your state tax and then medical expenses. So that's just a little sampling of tax deductions. So here's kind of the trick for us if we're talking, if I'm, if I'm kind of geared in and I'm talking to people who are college students, I want you to know that these tax deductions, when you look at those, those are often things that people who are a little wealthier or a little later in stage of life have those, right? Like they have mortgages and maybe they have enough extra money to do this charitable contribution thing and they're paying more in property tax and whatnot. So what is, you know, we have to sort of think what is the benefit for someone who is in a lower income stage? Because the truth is these are of more benefit to people who make more money. Um, and just to add a little bit other of a layer to it, so this is where we really start to get a little brain fuzzy when it comes to taxes, is in order to get the benefit from these tax deductions, you need to itemize on your taxes. So, and the way you do that is say, I have more in these kinds of tax deductions than the standard deduction. So this is kind of good news for people who are maybe not in the income position where they're buying a house and given lots of charitable contributions. So for you and anyone else whose deductions are less than the standard deduction, the government just says, you know what, rather than add up all those individual things, how about we'll just give you an amount of money that if um, that you can just take as the standard deduction. And so for someone who's single, regardless of how much you make or what stage of life you're in or any or how much you've spent on any of that other stuff, everyone can just elect who's single um, or married filing separately, they get a $12,400 standard deduction. So you kind of pick, you say, are my itemized deductions more or is my standard deduction more and pick which one you want. And then there's a different amount for twice as much for married filing jointly. And then if you're a single parent, um, you get some of the benefits of the married filing jointly. You get a bigger standard deduction, which is kind of a benefit for anyone who's a single parent. Okay, so that's kind of nice. So maybe this standard deduction, which means so if, stand, if, if you're not going to be spending more on deductions than 12,400, then that means that these things um, aren't really gonna end up really benefiting you as far as taxes. Um, another thing to just sort of note is that the more money you make, the higher percentage, here's another complication, right? Remember the simple formula that was income times tax rate? Well, here's where we made, we just made income really complicated by saying, well, some of your income counts and some of it doesn't. Now we're gonna make that next part of the formula really complicated too. And we're gonna say, well, sometimes you're gonna pay one interest rate. And then if you make more money, then that new money that you make is gonna be charged an a different interest rate. 
So that's, you may have heard of this is tax brackets. So this means, and sometimes we don't, we have like weird ideas about how tax brackets work. Um, I just wanna point this out because I know this is a really common misconception is it's just the next dollar that moves you into the next tax bracket. So for example, say that last year you made $9,870, right? All of your money was taxed at 10%. If this year you make $9,876, it's not gonna go back and charge all of your money 10%. It's just that additional dollar that puts you into the new tax bracket. That's, that's that additional dollar is what's gonna be charged the additional amount. So that's called your marginal tax rate, whatever your top tax rate is. And you actually do wanna pay attention to marginal tax rate. So it's not your average tax, it's different than your average tax rate. It's not the full amount that you're taxed, but it, it matters because it tells you how much those deductions are worth. And so I want you to pay attention to this. Um, you know, maybe we do have like some people who are later in their stage of life or, you know, you started an internet business and you have tons of money. I hope we have some people on this call who are, and make tons of money, or maybe this is just something for you to tuck away to remember for the future. But tax deductions become a lot more valuable the more money you make and the higher tax bracket you're in. So here's just a little example. Um, so we're just gonna say a $10,000 deduction. So this might be like, some people are like, that's a lot of money. This might be like the interest you paid on your mortgage might be, you paid $10,000 of interest on your mortgage this year. Um, if you're in the 10% marginal tax rate, so you're in that lowest tax rate, the money that will save you is $1,000 because you take the amount of the deduction times your tax rate and that's how much money you save. That's how much money. So you spent $10,000 on something that the government was like, cool, you get a tax deduction and then you get a $1,000 um, reduction on, um, on what you would have paid in taxes. And then if you're, if you're making a little more money than that, you're in the 22% tax bracket, then the savings to you is 2,200. But look at this. So this is why rich people, so 30, the 37th percent or the 37, the marginal tax rate of 37%, this is people who are making over half a million dollars a year. So people in that income category are always looking for tax breaks. Um, and tax um, deductions because they're really valuable to them. So if you times 10,000 by 37%, that's actually a savings of $3,700. But here's the point I wanna make is tax deductions are a lot more valuable the more, the higher your marginal tax rate. So kind of keep that in the back of your head as you're deciding, making decisions about taxes to say, if you're in a position, and a, a lot of you may be in a position where your marginal tax rate is zero, you actually don't, aren't required to pay federal um, taxes because you're in that income level, that means that these deductions don't really have a lot of benefit to you. Okay, so then, okay, so like, so now am I just saying, don't think about deductions at all, they're all a wash. Okay, here's just a little, little note. So, and again, another little complication um, that, so there are actually two kinds of tax deductions. So one that they're called above the line or below the line, and it would be a little complicated to explain why, but uh, um, if you above the line deductions actually kick in before the standard deduction. So there's some that you get no matter what. Um, and so if you are in that lower income, lower marginal tax rate, you still get a benefit from the above the line deductions. Oops, I just moved forward. Um, and those deductions are um, contributions to your IRA or retirement account. So even if you're not making a ton of money, you still can get a tax benefit from making those kinds of contributions or to your health savings account or um, business expenses. Those are some of the examples that are the above the line deductions. So that you can still take advantage of those um, even if you're gonna take the standard deduction. Okay, 
Okay, but here's where it really gets good. This is where the money happens for college students, right? It is in tax credits. So credits are kind of awesome. So you notice back here that deductions are only worth a percentage. So it's a $10,000 deduction, but you only get a percentage of it back. Credits, on the other hand, they come at the end of the formula, right? So we've got income times tax rate equals um, your tax liability. And credits actually reduce your tax liability dollar for dollar. And in some cases, you actually get money back from them. So some common tax credits that you may want to know about are at the child and family tax credits. So these are tax credits for dependent children. Um, child is for younger children and family are for a little bit older children like college students. It's above 16 years old. Um, credits are also for money that you spend on education. We're gonna talk a little bit more about both of these, the American Opportunity Tax Credit and the Lifetime Learning Credit. Um, those ones are super applicable to you all. Um, and then we're gonna talk just a little bit about the Earned Income Tax Credit because when I was a college student, um, this is one where we got a lot of benefit out of that earned income tax credit. And so even into maybe the beginning part of your working life, that will be something that could be a real benefit to you that's important to know about. So to, again, just a little review. The cool thing about tax credits is they reduce dollar for dollar the amount you owe in taxes. And then if there's, so say you owe $2,000 in taxes and you have $3,000 of refundable credits, you get your taxes all wiped out. You don't have to pay anything in taxes. Plus you get $1,000 back from the government on a refundable credit. So that's our favorite. Our favorite are our refundable credits. That's the, the best. Okay, so now a little pop quiz. I wonder, um, I want to see in the chat, maybe people will pop in there. So what would you rather get? Would you rather get um, a $10,000 tax deduction, so pretty significant, or a $3,000 tax credit? What would you say? $10,000 tax credit. So I already have someone saying definitely the credit. I know I just um, I just really um, like like told you how awesome credits are. <clears throat> so I hope this isn't a trick question. I hope some of you are thinking this through. But here's the answer. <laughs> but it actually depends. There are some cases um, where the tax credit is better, and some cases where the deduction is better. But just real quick, um, I won't spend a ton of time on this, but it is interesting to think about and helpful to think about. So if your tax rate is 10%, so you this means you don't make a ton of money and you don't owe anything in taxes. So this is probably a very common situation among college students or people really early in their financial life. Um, a $10,000 deduction would mean a savings of $1,000. Um, a non-refundable $3,000 credit actually wouldn't benefit them at all because it only can reduce tax liability. And if you don't have any tax liability, then it won't help you at all. So in that case, you'd actually take the deduction. Um, and then a $3,000 refundable credit, which is what I'm assuming most of you who said tax credit are thinking this is refundable, that's worth the full $3,000 to you. So obviously that's a lot more valuable. Um, then if you're in the 22% tax bracket, um, then you're going to get 2200 in the deduction. Um, and if you owe $2,500 or $2, $2,500 in taxes, that's the max that you could get is what you owe in taxes is what you can get back on your refundable credit. Um, and in the final category, so if you're a wealthy person, you actually want the tax deduction um, because that's worth $3,700 to you, um, where a non-refundable credit and a refundable credit, because you probably owe a lot in taxes, are both worth $3,000, but still that deduction is worth more. Anyway, now you have mastery. Like, I feel like if you're getting this, it's like lights on, you are totally understanding taxes because that's a somewhat complicated <laughs> um, table that I just showed you. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the earned income tax credit. So like serious money, guys, like of if you are especially like 
you know, it, when you're a young family and say you um, go to graduate school and that's the situation my husband and I were in when we were in graduate school, we were married, we had a daughter and the earned income tax credit was our best friend. So here's how it works and the logic behind it. So the idea with the earned income tax credit is it wants to reward people who are earning some money, but aren't quite making a living wage. So I remember talking about this in my class one time, and I had a girl in the back of the room, a woman, because she was a mom, and she, she was a single mom who was a college student, and um, I, I taught about this, and she's like, wait, I have not been filing my taxes for the past few years, and you're telling me I've missed out on thousands of dollars, and I'm like, yeah, get on it. Make sure this year you're filing so you get your earned income tax credit. It's really significant. But so it's it's geared at people like that. When you're making money, you're earning, you're working hard, but you maybe are working minimum wage. And especially if you have children that you're taking care of, the government kind of realizes that's a stressful, financial, difficult situation. And this is one of the ways that they really try to help people out who are in that. And what they're trying to do is actually encourage you to make more money. So you can see that this is how it works. There's a period of time when with the earned income tax credit, as you make more money, you actually get more back in the credit. Um, and then there's a little period of time where it plateaus out, you can earn more money and you still just get the same. And then when your income starts getting to the point where um, we start thinking, okay, this is a livable wage that family can live on this, then you actually have a phase out. Um, and here's what it like in 2020, this is what it looks like. So it changes, the amounts change um, according to the number of children that you have. So if you have no children, um, it's a pretty, it's this really light blue. It's a little tiny um, hump here. Um, so the end, but some of us are in that as college students were in that category where maybe I work a part-time job on campus or I work during just during the summers and so if your income is in this category um, like just you're just making a little bit of money up to it start it phases out completely at 15,000 so when you're in or I think that's the beginning of the next one I think it's this yeah, no, I think that is 15,820. So if your income is in that category, you are eligible to get the earned income tax credit. But it's really, really, it starts to get really significant when you have one or more children. Um, then you can really be making a lot of money. So this is like my husband and I, we, aren't, we weren't making a lot of money, but we would work part-time jobs a little bit. My husband would work during the summertime. So we were like solidly in this category of, um, of earning the earned income tax credit. So that's something I want you to keep in mind. And if you're thinking, hey, I think I might qualify for that, um, then I'm pay attention until the end because I'm gonna tell you about how some ways, and you've never done it before, and you're kind of like, how, how do I get this? Um, pay attention until the end, and I'll just point you to some people who can help make sure that you get the earn, earned income tax credit. Because it's actually a really big problem that people don't claim this. So so much of the earned, earned income tax credit goes um, people who could earn it don't claim it. Um, so it's important. Like, it's, I think it's just a lack of awareness that people don't realize. I've got a question in the chat. Um, oh, thanks, Ashley. Okay, so let's move on to your education credits. So if you're spending money on going to school, again, the government recognizes this is a good thing. This is not just going to benefit you. It is going to benefit you in your life as you increase what you can give out in the world. Um, but it also helps all of society. You becoming educated, becoming a working, participating person in our society has benefits for all of us. And so the government loves this, that you're going to school and they recognize it's very expensive and can be challenging to provide for yourself at the same time when you're trying to do that. So there's lots of help oriented around that. We're gonna talk about two credits that are available. And they're like, usually what people are doing is weighing out like which one of these should I take? Because you can't take both of them. You just have to pick one or the other for your dollars. You can't count your dollars twice toward these. Um, but we're gonna talk about the American Opportunity Tax Credit and the Lifetime Learning Credit. Um, just a little summary of the, the pros and cons. Um, so the, the really big difference here, I'll come 
I'll come back to that. The really big difference is what stage you're at in your college life. So the American Opportunity Tax Credit is really, really beneficial, um, but it's only available for students who are in their four, they only get four tax years. So you, ha you have to be in your first four years of um, higher education. So after you get done with high school, if you're in those years, but you can only claim it for four years. Um, so that's who is going to get the American Opportunity Tax Credit. On the other side, the Lifetime Learning Credit is available. It's a lot more open. So the student doesn't need to even be pursuing a degree. So this can be just like later in life when you decide to go take a few additional classes, um, but the money that you paid for that can actually be a tax credit. Um, um, another thing is looking at the total eligible credit. So the American Opportunity Tax Credit has, is a little bit more. So you're, you can get a credit of 2,500. That's the maximum amount where the lifetime learning credit is um, only $2,000. Um, so those are kind of what you're weighing out with the American Opportunity Tax Credit versus the Lifetime Learning Credit. I just wanted to, um, because I have had, I wouldn't go into all this math, except for I've had so many students benefit from understanding how the American Opportunity Tax Credit works, that I want to kind of like help you run through your mind to say, is this valuable to me? Like, would I qualify and how much would I qualify for? Um, so the first $2,000 is 100% counted as a credit. So if you have spent $2,000 on, and it's, it's qualified educational expenses, which is defined as tuition, books, like things that are specific to um, your education. Um, and so if you've spent at least $2,000, you get that $2,000 free or as a tax credit, which is you get it back to you. Um, and then the additional money up to another $500 is 25% of what you pay. Um, and then 40% of that, so if you owe taxes, then you get all of that back. But if it's um, only 40% of it is refundable. So let me do like a little, here's like a little math problem as an example. So say you've spent $3,000 in qualifying expenses. So you get that $2,000 right off the bat. And then you get 25% of the next thousand dollars. So another $25 or another $250. So your total credit is 3,250. So if you have taxes that you need to pay that are more than this, you get to use and benefit from that entire credit. If you don't um, and you just are getting money back from the government, then you'll get 40% um, of that, which is 1,300 is refundable. So the, you'll just get a check from the government after you file the taxes, you'll get a refund of 1,300. So, so, you, so here's the thing to note, and I'm gonna show you some examples. The American Opportunity Tax Credit can be claimed both by the student and by the parent. Um, yeah, so if you have a 529 plan and you pay tuition, I might have another expert jump on my, I, you can't get tax benefits twice. So you've already, if you're taking this money out of a 529, then I don't think that it can qualify for this tax credit, but let me, I'm going to collect, like, I'm going to show you, um, a, a little bit more. I'm going to show you how to claim how to claim, um, how this kind of works out on your taxes. So keep that, Jenny, you had that question, keep that in mind as we're going to the next examples. Um, but that is a really, really good question. Um, I kind of lost my train of thought. Oh, so it can be claimed either by the parent or by the child, as long as both of those people have paid some money toward the education, which in a lot of cases that is both the child and the parent have paid some toward college. Um, and so you want to strategize and say, how can we get the most benefit out of this credit? Um, and I'll show you some examples to think that through. Okay, so first of all, so here's the an example. Um, and I just wanted to illustrate how, how powerful refunds can be for students in this stage of life that you're in, you might be in, depending on what your career path is, you might be in this student life for a while. Um, so how do you make the most of your taxes while you're here? Um, so this is just an example. This is a married couple with a child, which again, I said, like similar to my, my situation. 
Um, but I think we're thinking of these people as being undergrads. So their total refund was $6,598. So they got a really, really significant refund. And I'm going to show you one little trick. This is the thing that we're going to talk about um, as a little, this is my trick. This is <laughs> um, of how they got $937 more by just making this one little change. Okay, so let's look at how this happened. So, uh, you know, college students going full time at school, maybe they're working in the summers or part time job. Together, they had income of $20,000. Um, so let's look at their original column and then we'll look how they how they maximized it to get a little bit more. Um, so adjusted gross income, so they didn't have any contributions. These are the above the line deductions. They didn't have any contributions to IRAs or anything. So they're just gonna end up taking the standard deduction, which is a little bit higher now than um, when this case was done. Um, but they're, they're gonna have zero taxable income is the, is the bottom line in this situation. Um, but they're still, because they are married and have a child, and low income, they're going to get that earned income credit, which is significant, right? For them, that's the bulk of their refund came from the earned income credit, which is $3,461. Um, they're also going to get a refundable child tax credit for the for their child. And then they get $800 in the American Opportunity Tax Credit, just the refundable part of it. So they have a total of $5,661 in refund, which I mean, most of us would file our taxes. We say we're getting that refund. We'd be super happy. But I just wanted to point out one little change that they could make in order to maximize their tax credit. So they have the possibility. So we're going to say that they had $6,000 in scholarship money. So maybe, you know, one of them has, or maybe both of them have a half tuition scholarship or depending on how expensive the school is, but they've received scholarship money as $6,000. So in a lot of cases, we think, well, let's count scholarships. You, if you put, if you take scholarship money and you apply it to your tuition, then it doesn't count as income, which in a lot of cases is good because that reduces your taxable income. But you can see for this family, it actually makes more sense for them to take that money they had in scholarships and rather than say we paid tuition for it, say we paid, and as far as how the IRS looks at this, it's all money in, money out. So they're not really going to say, well, how did you actually spend that $1 bill? It's more like on, on, the, on the income inflow outflow sheet, where, how much money flowed in and how much money flowed out. So we're going to count this money as income. If we count it as income, then we get to separate and say, okay, we had all of this money flow in. And now we get to still look at the costs that we had with school as part of our credit. So now their adjusted gross income goes up to $26,000, but still most of that is taken care of with the standard deduction. And they only, they have $2,000 of taxable income, which um, they're gonna be able to get a lot of that back with refunds, right? So now they get more of the non-refundable part of the American Opportunity Tax Credit. Their earned income tax credit goes down a little bit, right? Because, um, um, because they, because this situation has changed. And so they don't quite get as much on the earned income tax credit, but it still works out in their benefit. Um, because, and they still get that same child tax credit, but now they get the full benefit of the refundable American Opportunity Tax Credit. So that increases their total refund by almost $1,000. So, okay, so it's okay if you're starting to say, that sounds great, more money, but I'm a little confused about the details. It's okay. We're gonna get you some help. The, 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 the take home point is like, oh, having someone help me with this at this stage of my life might be really helpful. And you might take this question to say, hey, can I count? That's, that's the part I kind of want you to take away. So when you go to get some help from taxes, you can mention to them this idea of counting the scholarships as income. Um, okay, so just to kind of like, how it works so kind of like is a little bit clear in your head so here's all the money that came in right and it, this doesn't this is a different case scenario but we're thinking okay they had four thousand so imagine you're someone you had four thousand dollars of expenses 
Um, you had $10,000 of scholarships and grants. So this is including like your Pell Grant. And then you had $15,000 of living expenses. So if we take that scholarship money and we apply it to the qualified expenses, then the qualified expenses and the scholarship don't show up on our taxes at all. And so then the amount of money eligible for tax credits is gone. But if instead we um, have the qualified expenses and the full amount of the scholarship and grants, if we have that show up as part of our income, then now we get to count the $4,000 as applicable expenses and get some benefit from those refundable tax credits. Um, and just like, I know that I, like when I first learned about this, I was like, but is this totally legal? Like somehow it felt a little like, I, I don't know. I was like, is this okay? <laughs> Does the IRS know this is happening and are they going to come after me? So I found this document, which was reassuring to me. So this is from an IRS slideshow that they have explaining this. And it very explicitly says that Pell Grants and other scholarships can be treated in one of two ways. So you can either, so this is the choice you have to make, right? You can either exclude it from your income if you're using it to pay for qualified expenses, which in some cases, some situations, maybe where um, you can't, so maybe if you're in graduate school and you can't get the American Opportunity Tax Credit or you don't qualify for some reason for that, then it makes more sense to just sh show that you have lower income and have those kind of wash each other out. Or here's the other option. You can include it in the student's income and use it for living expenses. And in this case, the scholarship does not reduce the amount of tuition um, and can be used instead on um, those tax credits. So this kind of cool, right? Okay, so one little last example, just to kind of um, show you another way that this can be used. I'll go really quickly through this. Um, but this is, and this is just to tell your parents Right, your parent, maybe it makes more sense. Maybe if you're not in that other case, they were married, they had a kid. Maybe it makes more sense for um, your parents to claim the American Opportunity Tax Credit. So in this case, um, they switched and they put the three thousand dollars of income, and they had the student claim that as income. This three thousand dollars that came as scholarship money, the student claimed it. The student had a low. Um, tax liability. So they only have to pay $300. But that means that the parents, because they are paying for some of their child's education, they now get 25 or 20, I think it was $2,200 additional that they didn't get by doing it the other way. So just something to kind of have your parents, maybe your parents talk to your CPA about that and, um, and, and work that out. Okay, so here's just my last thought. Like I'm hoping you're feeling like it's okay if you don't understand all of those details, but if you got the big picture of, oh, there's kind of some serious money out there available if I get some help doing my taxes in a smart way. Um, how now, now I hope you're asking yourself, like, how do I get that help? What's available to me? Um, so reasons why you might want to get help. So if you're a student, just like we talked about, if you're a student and you are paying for tuition books, if you've paid something toward those qual qualified expenses, um, this is valuable to get some help and you don't know how to do any of that stuff, you've never done it before, get some help. Also, when you're in that low income level, so when you're in that possibility to earn that earned income tax credit. That's also a time I'd recommend looking into getting some help. If you have children, especially if you have children and in your in these kind of situations, if you're low income and have educational expenses, you're, you're going to benefit so much by getting some tax help if, um, if you've never heard of this and you don't know how to take advantage of these. Um, you could also benefit from getting tax help if this stuff is just really confusing you right now and you just want some help. It's nice to know that there is free, lots of free help and then some like low cost help that is available. Um, so college campuses across the nation and definitely here at the U has a wonderful program called VITA where they help, they, they take accounting students and students who've been trained in preparing taxes and they uh, meet with students. Unfortunately, because of COVID, the meeting in person part is not happening, um, but there are, there is some, a drop-off service that's available at the, um, it's at the Sorensen Center. I, I believe that is 
um, it looks like it's at 855 College Avenue. So you can, you can um, drop it off. You can also do virtual appointments um, through Zoom. And then there's special help for international students when it comes to filing taxes. Um, Utah, a tax help um, Utah is also a really great resource. Um, and I believe the, Utah, the VITA, they link to this Utah tax help. Um, you can get some like answers. You can also set up a one on one meeting with um, someone who can really help you or they looks like they are maybe at this time offering some in person, if you want that kind of help. So um, I would definitely look into Utah tax help probably um, right now in this situation, maybe one of the best places to get help on your taxes if you're looking to file that. Um, if maybe your taxes aren't that complicated, you're like, okay, I don't think I have that much complicated stuff going on, or maybe I've done this in the past and I just need a little bit of help. So TurboTax does have a free addition um, for simple returns. Um, so, and that I, when I have used, I haven't done my taxes with TurboTax, but I have um, looked at their software. It's really user-friendly. Like it really walks you through the step-by-step. -step. So if you're feeling like, okay, maybe I can do this on my own, um, I would recommend that. And when they're talking about a simple return, it means that your income in is in mostly W-2 income, maybe a little bit of 1099. Um, you can, they will help you claim the standard deduction. They can help you walk, walk you through the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit. Um, and then if you had some un unemployment this year, but they can't help you if you're itemizing deductions. So if you have that, then you're gonna need other help. Um, here's just another um, recommendation that I would give. So even though I love taxes and I teach a lot about taxes, um, I actually do have a CPA. Um, we have a little, some little complication things going on in our taxes with um, income from different sources and stuff. And so um, we have a CPA who helps us. And I love that, um, getting that help. And she is so affordable. She's done our taxes for years. And um, both my parents and my husband's parents have accountants that they work with. Um, and it's so much more affordable than a lot of people realize. Um, and so I would, um, there's lots of different ways. There's just, this is an example I gave. It's called Tax Buzz. Um, is a, um, a, a website that you can go to to get recommendations on local CPAs in your area. Um, but um, another thing is just asking friends and family for recommendation. Some of them may have worked with the CPA and know someone who's you know, honest and not too expensive to use. So that's in a case where you maybe do have a little bit more complicated things going on that'll be beyond the free, the free resources. So here's just my last little plug. Remember your taxes are due on April 15th. So if you have been putting that off, it's kind of coming up. We're about a month out from it, um, but I hope um, you have had some good ideas. And I guess we have just a few minutes um, for questions. I'd be happy to answer a few more questions um, and then I'll turn the time back to um, Ashley and Ruby. A fair price for ha handling a CPA. So I can tell you what I pay like my, and my CPA, um, has done our taxes for years, so she has most of our information in there, um, but she charges us about $100 for taxes, and it's, we have a little bit of complication. There may have been a year when she charged me like $150, um, but sometimes I talk to um, students who'll go to, you know, those places that are like inside of Walmart or whatever, and I'm, I don't, I don't think that those, I think they are reputable, but sometimes they charge really high fees. Like I've talked to people who've been charged hundreds, like three and $400 to have their taxes filed. Um, and I, I, I think that's really overpriced. If you're paying three or $400, unless you're like in a very, very complicated tax situation, like you have a small business or you have some rental properties or something like that. Um, I think that would, you know, I would, I would say you can find someone really good for that hundred dollar range. Um, financial advisors are better to pay back taxes than to have a return, right? Yeah, that's a really good um, question. Um, oh, CPA expenses are tax deductible. That's an interesting question. I'll have to ask my CPA because I do pay her, but I, I, I have never claimed her as a 
tax deduction. So that's, you've given me some homework to do. So I will, I've actually just like last week, I just gave her my documents. So I'll have to talk to her about that. I know there are like ones with investment advice, investment advice is tax stuff, but I'm not sure about a CPA for filing your taxes. Um, yeah, it's better to pay back taxes. So this is a really good question. So, so technically when you are um, when you get a refund, what it is, is the government's paying you back money that you overpaid. So you gave the government an interest-free loan for all the months that they've been holding on to your money, and then they give it back to you. So you really like, as far as like financial advice, you really don't usually want a giant refund. Um, because that just means that that money could have been going to better use. Um, some of the things when it comes to credits and stuff, you unfortunately don't have the opportunity to get that credit throughout the year. I sort of wish you did. I think that would be better than just getting a giant windfall. Sometimes we don't use that as responsibly. Um, but I personally, like, I... Like this is where, so, like I usually follow most of the standard advice when it comes to personal finances, but I actually usually get a fairly big return and I kind of like it. Like, so I, I know that I overpay usually. I also am really nervous about having to pay taxes, even though I'm usually in a position where I could. So it's, um, so it's um, great. Like, like I, your advice is right. You should, um, it's probably better to try and be as close and accurate on the amount that you're paying and reduce the amount that you get in a refund. Um, okay, someone asked, someone paid $500 for a simple return and they could have done the same thing with $40 on the HM, those software without having to do an in-person. I know, I'm not sure why those things are so expensive. Yeah. So that I, that's why I put it out there is that, and I think it's not something we talk about. There's a lot with money that we're just kind of, embarrassed to share the details. And sometimes that means that we end up spending a lot of money on things like tax preparation that um, that we don't need to. So yeah, I would say I, I, you're not the first person I've heard of who's paid several hundred dollars for tax prep and realized I don't really think that's worth it. So, well, thank you. If there are, I know we're close on time. Um, oh, there's maybe a few questions in the, there's like questions in the chat and in the Q and A. Um, Anyway, well, thank you so much. I will, I'll turn the time back to um, our hosts. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yes, hi, thanks, Janae. I don't know if you can see me. Can you see me? Uh-huh, yep. Oh, you can, good, okay. I just can't see myself on here. Let me go ahead and share the survey link. And thank you so much, Janae. That was so great to have you talk about taxes. And like I said, I love those charts. I think it makes so much sense because sometimes it's just like you put in your information on your tax return and then you see the numbers pop up, which is good. The software's so user-friendly, but that's nice to kind of see it broken down like that. So thank you so much. Yeah. Um, sorry, everyone, it looks like I need to click on the right one not the Q&A, the chat. <laughs> okay, well, we will also be posting this on YouTube if you would like to watch it again um, to get some of that information. But there's the survey link for all of you that stayed till the end. Thank you so much. And thank you for your questions. Um, we really appreciate it. We do have one more workshop this semester in April, and we will be hearing um, from Kimberly with Wells Fargo, and she's got some financial tips for college students. So that is all for today, but thank you everyone for coming and thank you again, Janae, for being willing to share your time with us. Thank you, Appreciate Ashley. It. All right. Have a good day, everyone.